Glory to God. Glory to God. Those have been praying, Leah, 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 those have been praying for your nephew. Do you want to tell them where it's at? Okay, so for those of you that might not have been in, um, in this prayer chain, um, my nephew Eli is two and a half, and about a day and a half ago, around dinner time, he drank some antifreeze. He, they found him in the garage, antifreeze all over him. It was really quick. He's the fastest little guy you've ever seen. So he runs in, drinks, and pours antifreeze on himself. They don't know how much he's taken, so they rush him to the stallery. Turns out he definitely ingested a bunch of it. Um, they ended up having to put him on dialysis and discovered dialysis isn't working. So they take him off and in the meantime get a second blood test and um, put him on a slower dialysis for his little body. Partway through the second dialysis, blood work comes back. He doesn't need to be on it anymore. They take him off. He's on medication. And so as of today, I think he gets to come home. So we're just, thank you for, I'm like, who is praying at noon? Because that's, uh, yeah, praise the Lord. We're so excited. So. Amen to that. Praise God. Praise God. Praise you, Jesus. Well, Father, I pray now that as we get into your word, that, Father, you would inspire us. And God, that the word today would uh, launch us into another dimension of our life and in our ministry and all that you have planned for us. And Father, we thank you for this house and for this season of our life. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to talk to you today about being faithful where God has placed you. And uh, I just want to acknowledge some of our churches around the world that watch the broadcast and, and uh, our friends. Uh, just God bless you. I know you're having great services wherever you are in the world. And, and uh, churches into Africa and Nigeria and Uganda and in England and Scotland, of course, our great Scottish family. We're looking forward to being with you soon. And, uh, and down into... Uh, Sarah down in Mexico and, and our Belize church and, and all of our locations in Canada. God bless you all. It's such a privilege to be a part of your life. And I want you to all be faithful where God has placed you. Be faithful where God has placed you. We started a few weeks ago with Brother Joseph here from India. And Brother Joseph was talking about obedience the power that you find in being obedient unto the Lord. And then last week, how many just appreciated the word that Leah brought last week? To give her a God bless you. Wasn't it good? I was watching the broadcast, and it was awesome. Well done. Talking about pressing into God and walking in obedience. And, and uh, the last message I did just before that was about Elijah and Elisha. And Elijah is a type of Christ. Elisha is a type of you and I, the body of Christ. There's a prophetic picture in the journey with Elijah in Elisha. And what we looked at was that Elijah, he was, he was uh, ready to quit. He was hiding in a cave. And God says to him, what are you doing in here, Elijah? Go out there and anoint some kings and find your successor. Because we're not done until we pass on what God has deposited in us to another generation. Can you say amen? That's our mandate, our goal. We're not done until that happens. And God tells Elijah, go out there and find your successor. So he goes out and he finds Elisha. Now Elisha's just out minding his own business in a place called Gilgal, which means the reproach of Egypt has been rolled away. And Elijah, type of Christ, throws out the call on Elisha. And Elisha, he's, he's plowing his fields. He just says, that's it. I'm not plowing my fields no more. And he stops plowing his field. And he, and he burns his plow and he you know, sacrifices the oxen. And he says, I'm going to follow after Elijah. Now, this is a prophetic picture. This picture is about you and I getting saved. 
Jesus throws out the invitation for you and I to give our life to him, to, to be saved and set free. But it's also about those that have already got saved that God throws out a call to ministry. And many times it happens all at the same time. You get, you get saved and you get called to ministry all at the same time. Come on, has anybody experienced that? That's Gilgal. And from Gilgal, Elijah led Elisha. Jesus leads us from getting saved to Bethel, which is the house of God. And in the house of God, we get equipped. We find out who we are. We find out our calling. We find out what our life is all about. It defines us as we, as we bump and grind and, and, and the pressures of the local church when, when you're interacting with other people. And it brings out the best and it brings out the worst. Come on. Why is that? Because the anointing is non-selective. you got to understand the anointing. When, God, when you say, God, I want to be more anointed, you've got to understand that the anointing is non-selective, that the anointing brings out the best and it brings out the worst. It amplifies everything about your life. It, everything gets greater. It, you, if you're a singer, you'll sing better. If you're a preacher, you'll preach better. If you're, if you're a pastor, you'll be a better pastor or prophesy. You, you'll prophesy stronger if you're a prophet, all that stuff. But it'll also not only amplify your strengths, it will amplify your weakness. <laughs> The anointing is non-selective. It, whatever it touches, it amplifies. And in the local church, it's all about being touched by the anointing so that your strength comes out, but so does your weakness, so that we can learn and grow and overcome the weakness so we can walk in the fullness of our strength. Come on. But that can be a hard journey at Bethel, the house of God, but God isn't trying to kill you. God's trying to bless you. He's trying to raise you up into the fullness of your calling and your destiny, not your plan for your life, but his plan for your life, not my will, but thy will be done. And he's trying to get you there. And he's been trying to get you there since the day you were born. It's been calling you and pulling on your life. And it's pulling you, pulls you into Bethel. And your whole church experience is all about shaping your life and preparing you for the real battle at Jericho. Jericho is a place of battles. So you get equipped in the house of God so that you can fight the real battle battle that God wants you to take on in your ministry life. But God doesn't intend for us to live in a constant state of battles either. He wants us to move beyond battle to the place of the Jordan. Elijah and Elisha ended up at the Jordan. That's a place of miracles. Hallelujah. God doesn't intend for us just to get saved and do nothing with our Christian life. He doesn't intend for the church to be the destination point. The church is the equipping center for us to go out and tear down strongholds and establish the kingdom of God. But we're not in battle all the time. We got we to gotta move beyond the battle battle into the place of victory. God says we should go from victory to victory and glory to glory. Come on, somebody. That, that we should live in the place of miracles. That's God's goal for our life. Hallelujah. They got to the place in Jordan. They crossed over, and, or before they crossed over, Elijah says to Elisha, what do you want? And Elisha says, I want a double portion of the anointing upon your life. I want a double portion of your spirit. And Elijah says, man, you're asking for a hard thing, but come with me. And, and when I'm taken up, if you see the fire, if you see the, the, the fire come, you'll know that you've got your request from God. They cross over the Jordan, and the fire comes for Elijah, the great prophet. The chariot of fire comes to take him home. And the fire comes and takes him up. And Elisha saw the fire. So Elisha knew that he was going to receive a double portion of the spirit that was upon Elijah. But he followed the fire. See, see, you, you, when you see the fire, seeing it's not enough. You've got to follow that fire and you watch for the mantle to fall. See, when, when the chariot came and picked up Elijah and took him up into heaven, the mantle fell upon the earth. And the mantle, because the mantle is not needed in heaven. Come on. The, the calling... 
the authority of God, the ministry gift, they're not needed in heaven. Those mantles are for here on the earth for you to go from victory to victory and glory to glory. So Elijah was taken up into heaven, but the mantle stayed here. But Elisha had to pick it up. He had to pick it up. And many Christians are sitting or standing waiting for the anointing to fall on them, waiting for the call to fall, waiting, watching the prophets and watching the healing ministries, watching the preachers and say, oh, God, God, if you would just pick me. God, if that prophet would just call me out of the crowd and, and give me a word, or God, if you would just do that. And God says, no, the mantle has fallen. If you can see the fire, chase after the fire and, and go pick it up. Come on, pick up that mantle. It's just going to lay there. But here's the thing. Elisha saw the fire and he went and picked it up to follow his calling, which was to be a replacement or the successor to the prophet. And many people don't grab a hold of the mantles. I'll just give the parents a moment with the kids here. hard when the kids start out preaching me. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Why? Oh, I love that kid. Why? <laughs> A lot of people when they see the mantle in the local church, they don't pick it up because somehow in our mind we've been conditioned to think that the calling of God, the mantles of God are to, for the pastoral ministry. That somehow that that mantle that's laying there, the pastor should pick it up. And we leave it there. We see that there's a call. There's an anointing in the house for a prophetic anointing or a, an evangelistic anointing or a, a healing anointing has fallen in the house. And, and, and many of us sit there and watch it. Why doesn't the pastor pick it up? Well, let me tell you why. Because God gave some apostles, prophets, pastors, and teachers, come on, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. The mantle falls in the house of God so the saints can pick it it up to do the work of the ministry. Come on, somebody. It's not just for the pastors. And, and not only that, that somehow in our mind, we've, we've conditioned ourselves to think that if I pick it up, I'm going to have to become a pastor. If I pick it up, I got to be an evangelist. If I pick it up, I got to go to a foreign field and be a missionary. But here's the thing. That mantle is, is meant to be used in the place where God has placed you. Come on. It will work in your business. It'll work in education. It'll work as a politician. It'll work wherever God has placed you. Come on, just pick it up and take it where God... Oh, come on, somebody. Hallelujah, Jesus. The church is to be the equipping center for you to succeed wherever God has placed you. Whatever it is that God has called you to, but you got to pick it up. See, a lot of people, I said this a couple of weeks ago, and I just want to say it again quickly here. A lot of people are waiting for me to chase after them. Well, why, why don't you do this, Pastor? Well, can we do this? Too? And they're waiting. So, well, you didn't ask me, Pastor. Don't wait to be asked. Chase after it. If you see the fire, if you see something that connects with your spirit, don't wait to be asked. Chase after it. Grab that thing and start Oh, come on, let's start your ministry. The church is the equipping center for you to succeed wherever God has placed you. Listen to this story. There was a story told of an 11th century German king, Henry III, who having grown tired of court life and the pressures of being a monarch, applied to a monastery to be accepted for a life of contemplation. <laughs> 
The religious superior of the monastery, Prior Richard, is reported to have said, listen to this now, Your Majesty, do you understand that the vow here is one of obedience? That will be hard because you've been a king used to using power. It would be hard for you to give that up and live a life of servanthood, live a life of obedience. It would be hard for you to, to say, well, I, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to surrender. I'll be a pastor. I'm going to be a missionary. I'm just going to give up my vocation, and I'm going to step in. He's saying it would be hard for you, O king, because you're used to using power. You're used to having people do things for you. You're used to giving instructions in order and having people obey them. You're used to having all of this stuff. <laughs> You're used to having your own way. This would be hard for you, O oh king, because you're used to using power. And the king replied, I understand. So for the rest of my life, I'll be obedient to you as Christ leads you. So the prior, he said this. Listen to the prior's words. Then I'll tell you what to do, O oh king, said prior Richard. Listen now. Go back to your throne and serve faithfully in the place where God has placed you. Isn't that a powerful statement? You know, oh, king, you're in a position of power. You're, you're, you're doing what you're created to do. You're, you're, you're there. That's, that's what God created you. Don't, don't give that up and come here and, and try to do what I do. You, you just pick this thing up and you go back to your throne and be faithful in the place where God has placed you. And I want to tell you, it's the same for you. You don't have to be me. You don't have to be a preacher. You don't have to be a pastor. You just pick Pick it up and you go back to the place and you be faithful in the place where God has placed you. Amen. Hallelujah. But you got to pick it up. Jesus just passes by and throws it out. But you got to pick it up. There's many people that did. Let's look at Luke chapter 5, verse 27, if we've got that. After these things, we went out and saw the tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax office, and he said to them, follow me. Look what he did. So he left all, rose up, and followed him. Then Levi gave him a great feast in his own house. And there were a great number of tax collectors and others who sat down with them. This is, this is really cool. Because what you see in here is a picture of workplace evangelism. You, why, why was there so many tax collectors came over? Levi, Levi responds to the call when Jesus is going by and calls him. Levi says, I'm coming, and he throws a party. He says, the rabbi's coming over to my house. The pastor's coming over. The preacher's coming over to my house. Where, where, Jesus is coming to my house. <laughs> Hallelujah. And, he, and he, invites the, he invites the people that he knows. Why was there so many tax collectors? Because Levi was a tax collector. These are people he worked with. It's the people he knows. The Japanese picked up on a Greek word called oikos. I want you to turn to somebody beside you and say, you have an oikos. <laughs> oh, good. I always wanted one of them. You have an oikos. What, here's what oikos means. Oikos means, it's a Greek word that means a circle of fellowship, a, a, a sphere of influence, a, a family or a community that you engage with on a regular basis. That's the Greek word oikos. And the Japanese turned that into a evangelistic strategy that was shaping the nation. It was exploding in evangelism because they took, they got everybody to create their circles of oikos. And they looked at things like 
like the, the people that are at the, uh, the gas station that I see every time I go in there to pick something up at the corner store or get some gas, it's the same people there. So I, I, I engage them a little bit. Or when I'm at the store, when I'm at the bank or whatever, I engage them. It's the same people. I'm getting to know them a little bit. Well, that's the outer ring of your oikos. But then there's people, maybe you're on a sports team or a social club or you're doing something where you're interacting with people. You're part of a team or you're part of a fellowship doing something. That's a, you get to know them a little bit better. So that's in, a, in, 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 a, in a, a, the smaller ring of your oikos. But then there's, then there's family and friends that you're around all the time and you see them almost every day. And, and those are in, in the center, uh, the, the closer to the center of your oikos. And then, of course, there's your own personal family and, and, your, and your marriage and all that stuff that's right in the middle. But we all have an oikos. Did you know you had an oikos, Kath? <laughs> Here's what the research of the Japanese determined. That you and I, all of us, have about 75 people in our oikos. About 75 people that we all engage on a regular basis. So why was there so many tax collectors invited to Levi's party? Because they were Levi's oikos group. These are the people that he saw, you know, five days a week or whatever they worked. I don't know. Uh, uh, he saw them almost every day. He got to know them. So when God touched Levi's life, he started to use Levi to touch their life. Oh, come on, somebody. You all got an oikos. <laughs> Look what happened, though. You're going to attract other people just like you. People that you engage. Luke chapter 5, verse 30. And their scribes and the Pharisees were excited. The scribes and the Pharisees complained. And here's what happens. Some religious people are not going to like the people in your oikos. Some of them will look and say, man, they're, too, they're, they're heathens. What are you doing hanging around with them? And what the church does is we buy into that thinking, say, yeah, you know, you're right. I, I should separate, come out from amongst them. And, and we get so good at coming out from amongst them that we don't know anybody anymore outside of the church. And, and we get inward focused. And because there's no flow coming in and there's no flow going out, we become stale just like a pond sitting out in the middle of a field where there's, where there's just stale water because there's no fresh water coming in and there's no water going out. So it just sits there until it starts to stink and get stale and no good for anybody because nobody wants it anymore. Come on. And the church becomes stale when we don't have the people coming in and we don't have people being sent out. We become stale because we become inward focused. We start developing deeper life clubs. And even worse... We're like a firing squad that stands in a circle and we start shooting at each other. We start, we start trying to fix each other. Oh, I know that person over there, you, you, they got to fix that and then they're over there and we're shooting at each other. We're standing there so we're inward focused. And God wants us to turn around and reach out into our oikos. Oh, come on, somebody. We get stale. There's no growth and no life when we, get, when we get inward focused. Hallelujah. And Jesus answered in verse 31 and said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician. Who's the great physician? Jesus. He says, if you're well, you don't need me to come and visit you. He says, I come to seek and to save that which was lost. I came to heal the sick. So here's what it means. If you would say, Pastor, I'm not sick. And I'm not talking about I don't have a cold, I don't have a flu, I don't have a tummy ache. That's not the kind of sickness Jesus is talking about. He's talking about, are you saved? 
Are you spiritually in right standing with God through the cross of Calvary? Are you, are you spiritually whole? And, and, and you say, well, pastor, yes, I, I, I'm spiritually, I am healthy. I, 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 I'm doing okay. Uh, spiritually, I'm all right. I, I, I'm feeling a little dead and a little dry, but I'm feeling all right. Well, here's the thing. If you're not sick, then you don't need the physician. You need to join the physician's team and reach out to your oikos. Invite the physician to come over to your house and bring your oikos to meet your Jesus. Hallelujah. And bring healing to your oikos. Bring deliverance to your oikos. Bring salvation to your oikos. Hallelujah. Tell them, invite them to your party yeah. to meet your Jesus. Lord God. I haven't come to call the righteous, but sinners. It's part of the problem I see in the knowledge-based modern church. We're inward focused. Mark chapter 1, verse 16. And as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, Jesus, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I'll make you become fishers of men. Look what happened in verse 18. They immediately, they immediately left their nets and followed him. Now, you, you ever stop and just think about that? And I say, wow, this is, this is crazy. Think about uh, uh, Elisha. When Elijah came and threw out the calling, Elisha says, I'm coming. But just a minute, I'm going to burn my plow. I'm going to, I'm going to sacrifice the oxen before we come along. I, I'm, I, I'm coming with you. And these guys, Jesus is going by and he says, hey, come and follow me. And immediately they left and they followed after him. And I'm thinking about this. I'm thinking, what do you suppose their parents thought? These are just young guys. They, they weren't old guys like me. These are just young guys. Elisha out plowing his field. Shows up at his door because he says, Elijah, let me go and say goodbye to my mom and dad first, but I'm coming. I'm going to follow you. And, and, and he goes, what, what do you suppose mom and dad said when he showed up at the door? Hi, Elisha, you done plowing that field already today? Wow. Well, no, actually, I burnt my plow. Sacrificed the oxen. I'm not farming no more. I'm gone. Can you imagine what mama and papa said? You did what? You burnt your plow? What's the matter with you, boy? Well, who's this Elijah? Well, he's a prophet. He's called of God, and I'm going to follow after him. Where are you going? I don't know where I'm going. What are you going to do? I don't know where I'm going to do. I'm just going to follow after him and see where it's. You burnt your plow? Boys, where are you going? We're not fishing no more. We're following him. Where's he going? I don't know. We're just going. We're following him. Here's my point. When you decide to run after it, when you decide to chase after it and get serious about following God in your ministry, not everybody's going to be excited for you. You know where I'm going with that, don't you? Not everybody's going to be excited about it. When, when, when Kim and I gave up our cushy career in mining industry, I mean, we had... I got paid crazy money to make coffee is basically what it came down to. I just sat in my office and collected money. It was, it was just, wow. And uh, God comes by, throws out the calling, and we walk away. And we're in church planning school before we went and started Life Church Drayton Valley. So that's 24 years ago. We're at a church planning school in the spring. And... Kim's dad phoned, just walked away from my management career, my pension, every, I burned the plow, couldn't go back. Her dad, a banker for most of his life, management all his life, very faithful, very diligent man. He phones his only daughter that he's loved since the day she was born. He is a sweet, sweet man all the days of his life. But he phoned 
And he says, this is stupid. You're being stupid. You gave up what? You burned your plow? You sacrificed the ox? You gave up your mining career and all that crazy money they were paying you to do nothing? You, you gave that up? You gave up your pension? You gave up all of it to follow after Jesus? Where are you going to go? I, I don't know yet. What are you going to do? Well, we hope to pastor, but we, we, we don't really know yet. We, we, we don't. Come on. Not everybody will be excited for you when you make your decision to chase after Jesus. There's a young man sitting right over here if you want to hear a story. I'm so proud of this young man because he lived it. He had to make a decision. Not everybody was excited in his family when he says, I'm going to follow after Jesus. When he said, I'm going to be a Christian. I'm going to start going to church. I'm going to learn. I'm going to be in the ministry. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to serve. And he just, he just overcome all the opposition. Not everybody was excited, and they forced him into a decision. You either serve, you, stay, you can stay here, stay at home, and we'll look after you, or you can serve Jesus, but you can't have both. And this young man says, then I will follow Jesus. And he burnt the, come on, he burnt the plow and he followed after a man he didn't even know. And he's serving in the house, preparing for a future that he can't even see yet. But I can see it by faith and I cheer you on, young man. You continue to follow after God. You don't know where it's taking you, but God knows. God knows. And if I can do it, if he can do it, you can do it. Don't let people around you shape what they think you'll become. I'm just going vision. <laughs> Verse 19 of Mark chapter 1 says, When he'd gone on a little farther from there, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who also were in the boat mending their nets. And immediately he called them. Look what happened. Look, doesn't this strike you as funny? They left their father Zebedee in the boat. <laughs> and I'm getting ready for today and I read this and it just struck me as funny. I, like if you could visualize this. When Kim and I have been to the Sea of Galilee, it's beautiful there. And, 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 and you, you just picture it. They're out there and they're fishing and they're fishing. Jesus goes by on the shore and says, hey boys, come and follow me. And immediately they're out of the boat, heading to shore, following Jesus, and leave Papa sitting in the boat. And I don't know why it struck me funny, but I was thinking, you know, I could just see them following Jesus, you know, going along the shore and then start climbing up over the hills. And they walk for half an hour or 40 minutes and they're getting to the top of the hills there and looking back and saying, yeah, still sitting in the boat. I think he's ticked. <laughs> I don't think he's too happy we left him out there in the boat. Said, Come on, somebody. Can you imagine? Just immediately say, that's it. I'm out of here. Bye, Papa. Leaving you sitting in the boat. Hallelujah, <laughs> Jesus. So why would these young men respond so quickly and so permanent, really? Well, here's the context of their culture of the day. The young men of the Jewish culture were all trained to become rabbis. They were trained as school children and raised with the intent that you will become a rabbi. But to become a rabbi, it meant that you had to memorize the whole Old Testament. So if you actually succeeded, by the time you were a teenager, you could quote the whole Old Testament, chapter and verse. You could, they, they, I've been told that, that, that you, could, you could name a bird or say, name all the birds in the Old Testament. And from memory, they could just recite all the birds that were there. Whatever you wanted to know, they knew the Bible. They memorized, memory. But not everybody could memorize it enough to become a teacher, a rabbi, the standard was very high. And if you couldn't memorize it good enough and couldn't reach that level, then the custom was you can't be a rabbi teacher, so you follow your father's trade. You go learn from your father and be, just do what he does. 
All of these young men were fishermen because their father was a fisherman. And they're following in the trade of their father because they didn't qualify to become rabbis. They couldn't follow the rabbi. They couldn't reach the standard of academic knowledge. Then Rabbi Jesus comes by and he gives them another chance. Rabbi Jesus comes by and gives you another chance. And maybe the academia didn't see that they were good enough to be rabbis. But Jesus knew their heart. See, it's like maybe maybe the academia, maybe you don't know the Bible. Maybe you haven't got a Bible school degree. Maybe you don't know the word. Maybe you don't know. Maybe not. But God's not just looking at what you know. God knows your heart. Come on, somebody. And so Jesus coming by, he gives you another chance to be in the ministry. Maybe the academia won't receive you. But Jesus knows your heart. And it's why we need to be preachers. It's why we need to preach into our oikos. It's why we need to preach the gospel in a nation that's claiming they're atheists and non-spiritual nation. That's why we need to preach, why we need to share the gospel so that people see that there's still an invitation, that there's still another chance. No matter what they've done in their life, no matter that there's another chance for them. So that people would know that they can be in the ministry. They can follow after Jesus. They can live for God. That God would work in them and through them. Because he knows their heart. Jesus says, I know their heart. Come follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. And some of those people are in your oikos group. Some of those people that don't know that there's a physician. Some of those people that have messed things up that are out there that are hurting and they're struggling and they're afraid of dying. They're afraid of what's coming next. They're, they live in a uncertainty, just trying to close in and just endure life and hoping that maybe you die and that's it, but afraid deep down inside that there might be actually a place called hell. I don't know how old I was when I had a knowledge of hell, but I was a kid, and I don't ever remember anybody telling me. I didn't grow up in a church family, but I believed in heaven and hell my whole life. And there is people in your oikos. There's people in your oikos that are waiting to hear that there's another chance. And if you would just throw your party, let people come and see how you live. You don't have to be freaky, spiritual, spooky, and, and walk around and, and, and speak to them in King James at the language and, and thee and come and, come and have some, some donuts. Bring thee. No, I don't even know how to do that. Thouest comest to have some donuts, sist. Coffeeeth, witheth. Neeth, saith. See, we get so inward focused, we create our own language. We know what we're talking about. Everybody else goes, these guys are weird, man. They don't, they don't know what they're talking about. Let them come into your life. Let, let them come and see what a, a normal godly marriage is. Let them see that once in a while the pastors cuss. My favorite saying used to be, that'll make a preacher swear. That's right there. What am I saying? 
Let them see that you're normal. Let them see that you, you, you found something that gives you hope for the future, that you're not afraid to die. Hallelujah, Jesus. You could say, I'm, I'm going to be promoted to glory. <laughs> it's a promotion. It's a promotion. Invite them. These people are out there, and they're in your oikos. If you're, if you're a tax collector, they will be tax collector. If you're a businessman, they'll be a businessman. If you're in education, they'll be educators, wherever they are. But they're in your oikos, and they're waiting to hear the call. They're waiting deep down inside. They're waiting and hoping that there's an answer. There's waiting and hoping that there's, there's another chance that they can, they can tap into something that will make sense and so something that they can hold on to, something that gives them hope for the future, something to build a life on, and they're just waiting for to hear the call. So invite them to come to your party. So ministry is all about be faithful in the place where God has placed you. Amen. Father, I pray for each and every one here today those that are watching the broadcast. I pray that you'd give us boldness in the place where you called us. God, just let us be bold. Let, let the world see that there's, there's fire on me. Let, let the world see. Invite people to come into your oikos so that they can see the fire on you that they could see the anointing on you. Hallelujah, Jesus. Let them come. Throw out an invitation. Some within your oikos group will respond. Some will. Not all. But some will. People that God has already connected you with right now in your oikos, some of them will chase after it. Just like you did when you heard about it. Just like I did when I heard about it. Some in your oikos will chase after it right now when you throw out an invitation. Some will chase after it. But you'll plant a seed in the mall. They're waiting to hear the call. Invite them to come to your party. And when they come, be faithful in the place where God has placed you. Give us boldness, God. Give us favor. And most of all, today, God, I throw the challenge out today. For those that heard this message, those that are willing to say, here I am, God. Here I am, God, send me. Here I am, God. From this day forward, God, I'm making myself available within my oikos. I don't have to I don't have to fly to Africa. I don't have to pastor the church. I don't have all I have to do is be faithful where you've placed me, God, in my oikos. And I pray from this day forward, God, that you would anoint each and every one here to see the harvest. To see those that are prepared to receive salvation. To those that are searching and looking that, God, there'd be a, an anointing of wisdom come upon this house and upon each one of us that in our oikos, in our, in our fellowship group, in our community, that we would be able to see it. We'd have wisdom and, and we'd know what to do. And, God, that the fire would work through us. And, and God, that they would see the fire. Give us a word of knowledge for them, God. Give, them, give us a, a, a prophetic word, God. Give us understanding for their life. Give us a healing anointing. Whatever they need, God, work through me. Let them see the fire, God. And God, as I throw out the invitation, may they pick it up in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for coming to church today. And uh, uh, next, next weekend, 
We've got uh, Rachel be here. Is she coming here tomorrow? Rachel and Owen will be here from Life Church Scotland. They're coming to spend a couple of weeks here. So they'll be with us in the house next week. And if you come back, I want to preach a message. You don't want to miss this one. It's called, When You're the Guy. When You're the Guy. When you pick it up and you're the guy, I want to talk to you about it next week. Come on back. I hope to see you there. God bless you. Thank you for coming to church. Thank you, worship team. It was wonderful. And uh, God bless you. Stick around and have some coffee. If you would like prayer, Kim and I are here. And uh, those that are on the altar team will be glad to pray for you. Come and, and have some prayer. Otherwise, we'll have some coffee and fellowship with you. And God bless you. Hope to see you throughout the week. Have a fantastic life. And be ready to minister within your oikos in Jesus' name. Amen.